Like me and your test suite is getting bigger and bigger, slower and slower. Our next speaker might have uh, the solution for you. All you need is 400 terabytes of RAM. Uh, please welcome Christoph Herr. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for, uh, for the introduction. Um, so, yes, my, my name is Christoph. Um, I'm working for SAP. So I hope you are not now running out of the room. Um, it should happen. But um, so we doing testing. We're doing testing a lot, and especially for one of our major products, um, which also needs a lot of memory, is um, SAP HANA. So it's an in-memory database, which is the reason why I need memory. And um, to give a very, very short introduction about HANA itself, um, so it's an, a column and a row store database, so you can combine your analytic workload, so typical um, anal um, analysis about your data sets, and your transactional um, workload, for example, um, such things like in session store. So you have a session in a web application and you store it into the applica in your da central database that uh, you don't uh, store them, for example, in cookies and so on. Um, in case you are scaling up uh, very quick and very fast, um, we can scale up very well. So um, I think the most prominent example is uh, PayPal with uh, 48 terabyte of memory in a single host system. So um, they have a lot of data and they are doing a lot of uh, very impressive things. On the other side, you can also scale it a bit um, out into different directions um, and using multiple hosts to power your database. For us as a developer, it actually doesn't matter because we can just use it as one single database. We are writing SQL or we're using other tools. Um, but for, for us as Python developers, it's uh, interesting to see that um, HANA itself ships actually a lot of Python coding. So a lot of system uh, management tools are actually written in Python because it's much faster to implement in Python. But the database core is written in C++ because of performance reasons and so on. So let's take a look um, how this um, bridge to, to Python itself. You have your application and you use our database interface which is um, um, implementing the typical uh, database interface API as defined in the corresponding pep turn within uh, 49. And you can use this database interface to connect with your database and run your statements. And in case you don't like to write SQL, so I'm not that big fan actually of SQL in my application code. So for example, I'm, I'm using a lot of SQL Alchemy or Django. Then I can use one of these two open source adapter to connect my application with, for example, an existing HANA database from some other application. So this was the introduction about HANA. Um, let's start about testing. And we are talking about testing a database. A database is actually software. There, there are maybe some people who say, yes, a database is magic, but actually it's just a very big and complex software, and you can apply the same uh, skills and tools on that software as on every other software. So we have, for example, um, three categories of tests, which are quite common. So we have unit tests, mostly written in C++, very, very fast to execute, and as they are fast, they are actually uh, not that expensive to run. Um, on the other side, we have integration tests. Um, so imagine a typical integration test for a database is connecting to the SQL um, service port and run some SQL statements to test a certain component a little bit. And at the end, we have full end-to-end -end tests to test the whole application running on this database. The problem uh, um, of end-to-end -end tests are actually that they are very slow and very expensive to run. So normally you would actually like to move anything in unit tests, but at some point it's actually not uh, possible. So we are talking about automated testing. And automation actually happens after the developer did something. And in most of the cases is after the developer 
created a change with new modifications in the source code. And maybe we should take a look at how our workflow is for a developer. A developer commits its change in our slightly big Git repository and push it to our central Garrett instance. Garrett is a, a quite um, popular code review system. So for example, there are other big open source projects like Android or OpenStack, which are using Garrett uh, to review changes. And after um, Garrett receives an, an change, we are triggering some pre-merge quality assurance processes. So even before the change hit our main repository, we are applying processes and automated things to ensure our quality criteria. The nice thing uh, in our organization is actually that we have uh, multiple of this quality insurance and for a developer it's actually quite nice because at the end um, of the day you get a review of your change from a specialized review team which says, okay, yes, your change looks good, this is a known problem, it's not related to your change and we can merge it. Or on the other side, you get a valuable feedback uh, from them where to look in which component, where, uh, where the problems happen. <coughs> so in this talk, I will mainly talk about the two most important and prominent examples, um, which is build and testing. So let's take a, a look at um, the point in time we started with this whole automation. It was actually 2010. It was nice. We had Garrett. Um, the developer provided the change and Garrett used, um, or we, we used a typical setup of Jenkins, which is quite common uh, use for continuous equation. Jenkins recognized a new change and looks up the configuration for this project, in our case it's HANA, and then queued this job in a queue and distributed across multiple nodes. And these nodes run the um, defined steps in this project. So we should take a look into uh, such um, run actually. So the first step is quite simple, pull the change. Afterwards we build this change and then we perform the setup. And these three steps are actually um, not the, that nice for us as Python developers because they are not written Python. But the biggest part of this um, whole process are actually tests. And tests are written in Python, so this is the good thing. And remember this blue color because everything um, which is blue is actually heavily Python driven. So this is a very common and still um, a very common pattern to implement continuous integration with Garrett. Um, we also added some special things. So for example, we have a central database which stores test results. Uh, build results, um, so um, not build results at its own, so not binary, but uh, some information ab about the builds. And with this database, we can also provide a very nice interface to the developers to review the progress of testing and the results of them. So this was 2010, and luckily for us, um, it, um, it reached out that HANA is actually a very um, nice product for our customers, so a lot of them uh, bought it and uh, we had to scale a little bit. So we scaled up actually to 600 developers, uh, which are currently working uh, on the core HANA code base. They are producing around 700 commits per day, which should be tested. We have 13 million lines of Python testing, so this is the point about a big test suite. And uh, actually now the main problem is, would we run now the test suite, we would have to wait for years actually, because uh, it's so huge and it takes a lot of time to run them. So the first thing you can actually always do is just throwing money at a problem. In our case, adding hardware. So we are adding 1,300 servers on them. And then we have over 400 terabyte of memory in, in conclusion. So this is actually nice, but the problem is it doesn't scale that nice. Um, so we had to think a little bit about how we can, for example, now use all the resources of these huge machines. So take a look at um, our scaling domain. So these are the 
four main problems we um, had to cover at some point, um, otherwise we wouldn't be able to scale. So we have a problem of test runtime, sounds maybe um, uh, already uh, common. So it's test scheduling. Um, we had some problems with artifacts, so tests have, for example, some expected results or some uh, predefined uh, data which should be imported before the test run. And afterwards, we have to ensure that the test environment is actually healthy to run the test um, because we don't want to um, complain that the test failed just because this one server was a little bit strange at that moment. So let's take first about test runtime. And as I said, uh, we had everything in one big Jenkins project, in one big Jenkins description. And as you can see, it's already longer than the slide and we are already in more than eight hours and you can imagine it isn't nice to wait more than eight hours until the test run is complete for your changes. Yeah, but actually um, we could increase this whole area a little bit more and after it wouldn't scale at one point. So this is the main problem. Don't run it in one big thing, split it up and make it even longer. So this was the first uh, thing we did. We increased the time because we just separate them, but if you separate build and testing, then you have to store some of the build results and then you have to move them uh, to your actually test nodes. But the good thing is, if you did this one slightly increase, you can decrease the time by splitting up the tests into multiple parallel running test blocks, basically. And the next big thing is, and a good thing is, if one of this test block fails because of reason or the node just went down and you have to restart everything, you don't have to restart this huge block of more than 10 hours, for example. And you can just restart this small block in, in the best time after seven hours you have your result. And we can also improve this a little bit to get even faster results for our developers. So this is how we actually solved our test runtime problem. But the main problem about tests are that they can fail. So it would be nice if they are always green, but they all, uh, also fail sometimes. And it's actually a good thing, because that means your test still does something useful. Um, but sometimes it could be maybe a sporadic issue, some strange timing problem, some race condition which is very, very hard to detect, um, or even an infrastructure problem. So maybe some uh, operation um, person just installed the wrong package version on this one node and b because of this reason, this particular test always fails on this one machine. Our solution for that is throwing hardware at that point and just rerun the test. Um, and in case it fails also on a different machine, it, we know, okay, this is a real tester and for sure someone has to look at it. At some certain points, we are looking always on all failed errors, so don't be um, scared about it. But one problem is who restarts the failed tests actually? Would we do this with Jenkins? Uh, we had a lot of uh, problems actually. Um, so we started to think about test scheduling. And test scheduling are um, divided in two areas in our setup. So we have one area for this whole configuration. So what tests should now run actually? Should we now run the very expensive and long running end to end test? Or should we maybe start with the fast unit tests? Um, we have over 600 developers. They are not, not all working in one Git branch. This wouldn't make sense. We have different Git branches, and they're most of the time for uh, different components, and these components can define their own test set, which should run in case a developer provides a change. So this is also part of test scheduling. Um, I already mentioned that unit tests are much faster, so it is maybe a good idea to run unit tests first, and afterwards, uh, maybe some slower integration tests. 
And we have other features like excluding some current known uh, broken tests or um, um, such things. And then the next thing is that someone, hopefully not a human, has to observe this whole procedure and reschedules failed tests and provide maybe an automated review for it and also notify, that, uh, notify the developer that your change is now complete, um, tested, and you can uh, take a look on the results. And we solve this with putting Python into the problem or basically in solution. So we implemented a very small, it is actually not that small anymore, so um, it's also growing, um, component, we call it the waiter because it's waiting for tests or basically waiting for test results. And it's uh, connecting with um, other infrastructure tools. For example, it's using our database which holds this whole configuration for branch uh, specific runs, but also it's connecting with our bug tracking system to know, okay, this is actually now a change, which should fix now this test error, okay, I have to run this test, for example. And the waiter is now controlling our Jenkins instance and informs Jenkins, please run now this thing and now run this thing. <coughs> this is nice and we, um, as I mentioned, we have a lot of hardware, but hardware is always not enough. So we have queues. And the problem about queues is that you have also requirements on your service itself. So um, in, in our case, we have the requirement that uh, night details should be complete in the next morning, that bug fixes uh, should be prioritized before other um, new features. And if we started testing a change, we should definitely make this first complete before we uh, start testing in different um, te um, change. So the first thing is we can solve this with Python again. So we have implemented a prioritized test queue and we can now sort them with some magic and then we can distribute them with a queue processor which is also implemented in Python to multiple Jenkins masters because I can say Jenkins doesn't scale that well. Uh, after 300 nodes, you should definitely start a new Jenkins master. Um, but maybe it's only my own problem. So let's talk about artifacts. Um, we have the problem or the nice thing that our um, product is very heavy. So we have an installer which is around um, 50, um, 15 gigabyte and we have to distribute it after the build process. Which means in our case, we are transferring nine petabyte of data every week just for <coughs> testing. The good thing is it's in our own data center so we don't have to pay for this traffic. <laughs> but you are hitting bandwidth limits so I can say 100 uh, gigabit links are sometimes not enough. So we have also to scale in this area and we introduced a local caching implemented with Python. So we cache them locally and then we can install locally from the result. And the nice thing is we can do this also for our big test data, which um, also is sometimes quite big. So we have, um, for example, some tests with a huge bunch of um, imports at the beginning. So local, the local cache and a nice thing with Python, which is actually um, uh, within Python script, which is not that big. It's around 200, 300 lines. We could reduce our traffic to just three petabytes. It's better than nine. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, test the health environment. So the main problem is that sometimes external dependencies will fail. Basically, they will always fail. It's some certain scale, there are outages and they're increased and it is not a lot of fun actually. Um, the next thing is we are using these uh, big machines and we have to um, utilize them very well actually. So we are running tests for example in parallel but this introduced the noisy neighbor problem so tests could um, affect each other so it is uh, quite common that for example one test is consuming all 200 cores of a machine, which is not good because all uh, other tests would also, uh, would also like to use the uh, CPUs. So the solution for this is that we introduced a health check 
before and while testing. And in case this track and notice that there's something wrong on this machine now, uh, the test is um, a little bit crazy, then we can abort this test, we can take a look at them, and it is totally invisible for the developer because we just rescheduled them on another host and it will not affect the review, for example. So let's take a look how our current infrastructure looks like. So we have still Garrett. Um, but we have something else, we have a build infrastructure, so a totally separated team, um, which is also using a lot of Python, so this cloud is also blue. Um, it's actually not a cloud, but yeah. Um, so they're using a lot of Python, and after the build is complete, we get a notification. Our waiter implemented in Python, knows what to do, co um, connects with our uh, central uh, QA database, um, triggers the required test runs, the queue processor distributes them across our Jenkins masters. I think right now we are operating more than 10 or something around this area. It's not much, um, much of fun actually. And if we take now a look into uh, how our process works, we are seeing more Python. And this is a good thing. It's, it's much faster and we have everything under our control most of the time. Um, and we still have our central database, which gets all the re uh, results from the test runs, all information, and the developer is still able to click actually in the same web UI, so there was not that much transition in the web UI to get results. So what is my message? My message is actually Python is great, also from our side, because the learning curve is so good that non-developer people can write really useful tests for us. There's a big, very great community, so we are heavily relying on things like PIP or Sentry. The development velocity is for us very great, so there are days people coming into office think, yes, this could be a good idea and we could maybe reduce our traffic, and at the end of the day it is maybe um, already in production, but most of the time it's um, in, in our test landscape to test the test landscape. It's a very confusing naming scheme, actually. But the best thing is it's platform independent because you have to test HANA on three different CPU architectures and around 12 or 13 operating systems, uh, operating system versions, but it's nice that Python is so universal um, that we can actually run all the same versions of our um, applications on the different platforms. So from my point of view, this is just the beginning and I would like to increase the Python um, um, amount in our infrastructure for much other tasks. So maybe I should share a little bit um, of an outlook. So we are going in our idea, so we are not buying hardware yet. But we are thinking about scaling up to something like 3,000 nodes. How could we do this? Um, we would actually like to replace Jenkins with something more scalable. Um, so we are currently playing a lot with Apache Mesos uh, for this to make a little bit more um, useful resource-based scheduling. Uh, thinking about um, yeah, utilizing um, Amazon Spot instances, for example, or something like that. Um, instead of checking, we would like to limit our test runs. Um, so isolation is a very um, nice thing in our case, so we would like to limit memory, CPU, I.O. And we would actually like to uh, mic migrate even more services to Python 3. Uh, we have some services and they are very nice um, in Python 3 and I think Python 3 is a big step forward, um, but you can imagine um, on such big code base, it's actually not that easy to migrate to Python 3 right now. So, in case you are now interested, or hopefully you are interested in testing software, not just playing around with big hardware, but we can also do this, um, we are actually hiring. So, in case you like hardware, software, and testing, um, you should follow the links, um, and in case of questions, please look around. Um, in case you have the same problems, please look for me. Um, I have a lot of questions how you solve such things, uh, like long-running tests, um, 
because for us it's sometimes a huge problem. Thank you very much. Um, we have time for questions. I have a question about the provisioning of the um, nodes that are running the tests. Um, are, they, uh, are they running something special that is internal to your company or get they provisioned by your team with some operating system and the tools that are necessary to be run? Uh, so in other terms, is it difficult to reprovision them for another team or how do you solve these kind of questions or reprovision new servers if you want to expand it to the um, server chain? So currently we are getting them imaged with a, a very configured image from our local IT department. But afterwards we are running some of them. It's uh, called a big bash script. Um, <laughs> So it's internal at some point. Um, we, we tried out Salt and Ansible, but um, actually I think we was not that committed to them yet, but um, it, it works actually quite well, so yeah. Is your best script committed? <laughs> the best script is committed and under version control. Everything is under version control. <laughs> so not that big deal, but... Um, more questions? Uh, so the test suite that huge, are the developers even able to run the test locally before checking in, or we must basically commit every change, change and uh, hope for the best that it runs? So um, you now know what our test server looks like. You can now imagine maybe how the developer workstation look like. Um, so a typical developer workstation has around 128 gigabyte of memory. So they are able to run them locally, um, but not all, uh, not all tests. So for example, distributed tests with multiple nodes, it's very hard actually to run them locally for developers, but for them we provide such a service. What do you use as test runner, like PyTest or unit test, or do you have your own? Um, so for our infrastructure tools, we are using PyTest. So we are, have a lot of uh, nice fixtures, actually. So setting up, for example, a Mesos instance with just one fixture, it's very interesting and sometimes scary. Um, the tests for the database are written actually in a fork of unit test, even before it was unit test two. So you can imagine how this involved at some point. More questions? Yes. To me, it just sounds a bit like there's a lot of code that's been uh, amassed over time. It's, and, and like, I don't see why you need so many tests and like such a big code base for like 30 million lines of, of code, of Python code to test it. That just doesn't sound like a normal memory database. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, we still run the tests because they still find things, they're really fine bugs and um, sure, maybe it's not the best optimized Python code, so maybe you could even remove something like um, 100,000 or 200,000 uh, lines of code just with refactoring some tests. Um, but um, at the end, the tests are very, very valuable for us and um, I actually wouldn't like to compare, for example, now HANA with Postgres, but um, HANA has a lot of more features and very complex features, actually. So there are different uh, engines inside of them, and this is the reason why we have also a lot of tests, and um, we, we just made the experience that testing upfront is very, very uh, cheap compared with the other way around. So our customers are relying heavily on our quality standards. So um, 
we are we are still totally um, convinced that it's worth the, the expense to do such big testing. Actually, do you have a feeling for like the cost of um, hardware and electricity compared to people to develop the software? Like, is it still a a very small fraction, like a few percent, or is hardware and electricity a significant fraction of the cost of developing HANA? Um, I'm pretty sure I'm not allowed to, to share numbers about this topic. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's actually a good question. Maybe we should calculate them, but I'm still sure we are not allowed to share them. So um, I, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, but I think we are, we are using a lot of electricity here. And, um, <laughs> but, but the good thing is um, we are using uh, green energy, so this is... So, so maybe I can redirect the question. So on the, on the technical side, if you say you have 400 terabytes, like how does this actually work? I mean, is it... Thousands of, I mean, it's not one no, machine, no, no. right? No, 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 it's, no, it's distributed across multiple machines. So, but it looks like, like to the, no, to HANA, it looks like one piece of memory? No, no, no. okay. No, so it's, uh, so our whole landscape combined is above 400 terabyte of memory, uh, but we have, for example, nodes with two terabyte of memory or three terabyte of memory, um, and it looks like three terabyte of memory of RAM. So the first time I opened an HTOP of one of this machine was very impressive, actually. And HTOP is still able to work with them. So HTOP doesn't crash. It's a huge win for that. So you have an extra big screen for the HTOP of this machine, right? I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, this is, this is the main problem. So I think nobody of you copied the HTOP configuration around. I have to do this always because I have locally the HTOP configuration which says, don't show all cores, please. <laughs> and I have to copy them around because otherwise I'm not able to use my terminal um, afterwards. And I cannot even reconfigure it because I cannot see the setup panel of <laughs> HTOP. So these are the problems. OK, we are out of time. Thank you for the questions, which could probably be summarized with, are you serious? Yeah. Uh, thank you again. <laughs>